Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. So this is the second part for VPC and if you haven't watched the part one then I would seriously request you to please watch that. And in today's session we will be discussing the basics of VPC and we will be talking about security groups and cyber blocks and many more things. Okay and before moving forward if you would like to support my work now you can support me on Instamojo or PayPal and you can also join the membership on the channel by becoming a tier one Patreon member for early access to all the content. So without wasting any more time, if you're ready, let's begin. So let's do a deep dive on the security groups and we will see what are the additional information that we need to learn for the certification. And there are a lot of information that we need to cover. So sit back, grab a cup of coffee or tea or any energy thing that you like and let's get this over with. And as we have already discussed, security groups actually act as a firewall or virtual firewall for our instances to control inbound and outbound traffic. What does inbound and outbound mean? It means that inbound points to the incoming traffic or the requests that come into the host and the outbound points to the outgoing traffic, which basically is the request that are going from the host machine to the outside world. And as you can see in the diagram as well, we have the EC2 instance and the access is inbound and outbound. So by default, all the incoming rules are blocked to the EC2 instance. And by default, all the outbound rules or the outbound traffic from the EC2 instance is allowed. So you need to remember that you, you can't create rules that deny access. If you wish to block SSH, then simply you don't add a rule that allows it. Okay. And if you wish to have HTTP access, allow port 80 as a part of the security group. Okay, so there is no restrictions. You can add or remove rules at any time. And when we talk about security groups, there is a very important question that comes along what is called connection tracking. So in EC2 instances, if you send a request from your instance, the response traffic for that request is allowed to flow in regardless of the inbound security group rules. That is what makes security groups stateful and that is being achieved by connection tracking. So what it means is that security groups use connection tracking to track information about traffic to and from the instances and the security rules are applied based on the connection state of the traffic to determine if the traffic is allowed or denied. For example, if you take ICMP ping command, you ping an instance where ICMP is added to the inbound security group rule. Okay, so information for that traffic is not tracked. So it is not considered as a new request, but rather it is viewed as an established connection to the instance, even if the outbound security rule has not allowed ICMP. Considering a security group name is unique to a particular VPC, this seems to be a bit unclear, isn't it? So let's check the example table here. So in the table here, we have both inbound and outbound rules that you see here. So we have the inbound rule and this is the outbound rule. Okay, so now, so now one thing you need to note down is not all flows of traffic are tracked. As in if the security rule permits TCP AT port for all the traffic and from the other end, it allows all the outbound traffic, then the flow of traffic is not tracked. So if you see the example here, we have security rules for TCP and ICMP where the outbound rules allow all traffic and TCP traffic on SSH or port 22 here is tracked cause the incoming traffic is not allowed for all IP addresses, even though all outbound rules allow the traffic. So if you see here, so the TCP rule that you see here is 22. So for SSH and that is being tracked because the inbound rule states that any of the source IPs that are in this range are only allowed access using SSH. And that is why it is being tracked. But the TCP rule, HTTP AT port, it has all the source IPs allowed in both inbound and outbound rules. So that is why it is not tracked because it is both a bidirectional allow all traffic. And when you create the security groups, you can name them by anything that you want, but it should be unique within the VPC. So this is something we need to keep a note of. Okay. 
So let's again recap some of the most important points that we need to remember for security groups. So first and foremost, security groups actually control how the traffic flows to and from the EC2 instances or the machine. And they act like our virtual firewall. So by default, all traffic is blocked for inbound traffic. So remember that all traffic is blocked for inbound traffic and all traffic is allowed for outbound traffic. Okay, so by default, when you create an EC2 instance, if you haven't provided anything, then the default security group allows all the traffic or all the requests that you send from your instance to the outside world. But the incoming is always blocked, but you can access the other resources. Okay, so the security groups are attached to a region and VPC and security groups can be attached to multiple instances and multiple instances can have a common security group. So you can create one security group and you can assign it to multiple instances as well. So the EC2 instances have no idea what's going on with the security groups. So it acts as a virtual firewall. So your EC2 instance level security is being maintained through the security groups and we don't place anything within the instance itself to protect it from the incoming or the outgoing requests. We have that in place of the security groups itself. And we should actually always create a separate security group for SSH. So now let's get back to some of the basics before jumping onto the tough stuff. So we all know that there are different types of IP addresses, right? So IPv4 and IPv6, but we must also be aware of what are public and private IPs. So let's take a look at this example now. So these are the two web servers and uh, they are able to communicate over the cloud or the internet that is the World Wide Web. But how? The thing that we see here is that they use public IPs. As the word suggests, public IPs are the IP addresses that can be accessed over the internet. And you can think of them as a mail number or a mailbox number which anyone can access to communicate with you. So if you have a public IP, Anyone can access the data that you are broadcasting if they have sufficient permissions. And in your daily life, you are using Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all these sites that have a public IP mapped to a DNS or that is the domain name which can be used to access the site. So naming your site is always better because no one would remember the numbers, right? Remember a huge pile of numbers over a fancy name, isn't it? Let's take an example like Google. So it's fancy, isn't it? But what if you are in a private space like your office or your private home servers then things would be different so if you see here there is a private office internet space which has the provision to communicate within the organization or within its own network but not the outside network without the help of the public internet gateway and that is why we call them private they have isolated scope to be accessed within the network more so the office or the home network and they can't be accessed globally so you cannot access a private IP from outside its network until and unless you have a VPN connection to the network or something that you can grant access with. Okay, so what is the important thing that you need to remember here? So if you have a public IP, anyone can access the data that you are broadcasting if you have sufficient permissions. And just like you use in your daily life like Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, all these sites have a public IP that is mapped to a DNS name. You cannot access a private IP from outside its network until and unless you have a VPN connection to its network or something that can grant you access. Okay, so I hope this was somewhat of a clear understanding of how actually things work with public and private IPs. So let's move on. So now let's get some of the basic differences out for the public and private IPs. So the first thing is like IPv4 uses a 32-bit address scheme that allows you to store up to 2 to the power of 32 addresses, approximately 4 billion addresses. So on the other hand, we have IPv6. It is the most recently used of the IPv protocols. It uh, uses a 128-bit address scheme that will not end in my lifetime at least. And IPv4 are numeric addresses like 192.23.12.2 separated by dot and IPv6 are alphanumeric whose binary bits are separated by a colon and it also contains hexadecimals. And as we have already discussed, a public IP is an IP address that can be accessed over the internet that is mostly masked by a DNS like web server, email server, whereas private IP addresses of a system is the IP address which is used to communicate within the same network. There is an office space or the private space and public IP are globally unique but private IPs are unique over the local area network 
and you might have to pay for a public ip but private ip is usually your own and company managed and these are the classes of ip ranges that we have for both the public and private ips so if you see here we have for the public ip we have class a class b and class c so the class a start from 1.0.0.0 to 9.255.255.255 and that ranges to 11.0.0.0 to 126.255.255 and public ips can be geographically located means you can go over the internet and find from where the ip has come from and who is the host unless it is secured but private ips are private and you cannot find them online okay and now let's start off with a very important topic that most of the people don't explain that is cider and the reason I'm saying you this is because even though our channel wants to help with everything that we have, people will still question our integrity. But we have to prove ourselves that we are willing to grow and not to anyone else. So let's start off by understanding what is CIDA and why is it important. First thing, what is CIDA? So if we take the acronym or the full form for CIDA, it says that CIDA is Classless Interdomain Routing. So I hope you remember your engineering network classes. So classless was termed as like where we actually ignore the address classes like A, B or C. And we consider it as an idea where the IPv4 address has two parts. So the prefix part and the host part as defined by the masking values. And we don't consider the class here. Unlike what we did in the classful one. And we use this classless addressing and interdomain routing which is a type of routing algorithm that works within and between domains. And when we create a VPC, we must specify a range of IPv4 addresses for the VPC in the form of a CIDR block that is our classless inter-domain routing block so that we tell AWS that we are going to create the VPC and we need this block of network addresses as a part of our family. So within which we will divide this and make small parts and that is what we will learn next. Okay, so the first thing that you need to remember here before creating one of uh, the classless interdomain routing CIDR is the method for allocating IP addresses and for IP routing. Okay, so CIDR is a method for allocating IP addresses and for IAP routing. So the value that you see here 10.0.0.1 slash 16 is a CIDR block and you don't have to take my word for it. Why should you believe if I say that it's a CIDR block? So for that, let's learn why that is a CIDR block. Okay, so for now, think of this 10.0.0.1 slash 16 to be an IPv4 address range. That will make up for our VPC. But if you see this, the block is being divided into three parts. So the first part is the IP address. The second part is the slash that you see. And the third one is a decimal number. And each of them have a or each of them has a certain significance. Okay, so the first half represents the IP address and the second half is your subnet mask. So collectively that slash and the decimal actually is termed to be a subnet mask. So don't worry if you don't know what is a subnet mask, but remember this for now. And if you see the image here, we can understand that a VPC moves across all the availability zones that we have. And considering that we are not going to create availability zones that is already available and AWS provides us with the availability zones, what we are going to create is we have to create smaller groups that can be termed as a subgroups or networks or subnetworks or what we call as subnets. And in VPC, you can add more than one subnet in your availability zone. So don't get confused here. AZ is itself a resource center where you can host applications we will just provide it a network group so that we can access the instances and the resources there. But what our intention is here, just we are trying to name our smaller family groups. I hope you remember we discussed local zones where we actually discussed about AWS regions and we can also add subnets in local zones as well that will help provide services closer to our end users for faster access. And if suppose I want to create subnets in uh, availability zones, then I have to create them by taking a subset of the CIDR block IP range and make a subnet out of it. As AZ is isolated, your subnet should remain within the availability zones because uh, for what? I'm asking you this so that actually we can eradicate a single point of failure. And that is why we call it as high availability. If you create 
one subnet that is actually spanning across two three availability zones there is no point in making it isolated isn't it and that cannot be possible as well so i'm just saying in terms of actually explaining to you why it should be isolated within the availability zones or why it should be available within the isolated availability zones okay so that we can eradicate the single point of failure and as i'm speaking just try and imagine that we have subnets in these availability zones and they are isolated from each other but are made by the subsets of the cider block okay so let's suppose there's a cider block so these are made from the subset of the cider blocks and now as we need ip address we need a range from them isn't it so now if suppose i want to access an instance from this availability zone and it should have ip address right but this actually needs a set of ip addresses or a range of ip address because there is not going to be only one instance isn't it there can be multiple instances so for that we need to understand the number of ip address allocations okay so the subnet mask that you see here slash 16 is the one that is going to determine how many ip addresses are you going to get out of this cider block so subnetting is a concept of dividing a network logically to create separate space. So by the way, we determine how the network has been divided. We look at the subnet mask, which tells us how it has been divided and how many IPs are there in the subnet or, or the subset or the network that we have. And if you see below, so 192.168.0.1 slash zero, actually it covers all the IPs in the range and slash 22 here covers 1024 IP addresses and slash 32 can only cover one IP in the IP range. So you must be feeling that the way it is covering the IP range actually depends on the masking value, right? So slash 22 slash zero slash 32 and all the IP address remain same and the subnet value is only changing and there the IP range is also changing. So you might be feeling like the subnet value that we have here is basically the determinant factor to determine what actually would be the coverage of the IP addresses. But the question would be how? How is it doing that? So that's what we'll understand next. So when we talk about the subnet mask, you might have already seen something like 255.250.250.0, isn't it? Or at least heard someone like use the term, hey, the subnet mask for this IP address should be this. But when it comes to AWS or Unix based terminology, we come across subnets or like slash 22 or slash 16 or slash 24. And in our sessions on AWS, we will be referring to these type of terminologies that is with slash rather than IP patterns. So these are the two forms of subnet masks. So that we have. So one is IP based pattern and the other one is slash based that is slash 24 slash 16 or slash 32. And in, but in this session, I want you to understand both the ways. So even though you won't use it, I want you guys to understand the concept. And when we talk of IP addresses, we know that an IP address is a 32 bit number that uniquely identifies a host. So host can be a computer or other device such as a printer or a router on a TCP IP network. So this is the textbook definition, isn't it? And as you can see here, we have the IP address 192.168.123.54 and it's 32 bit representation. So when I create an 8 bit binary for this value, then I get the below long 32 bit representation. So 1160.1010100.051 zero five ones sorry four ones zero one one dot zero zero one one zero one one zero so this is basically your 32 bit representation so you can count the number of digits here you will be having 32 because everything is 8 bit okay so 8 into 4 is 32 so simple maths so there is a site actually you can validate this online and you can use the google to actually validate this so you can just go online and check for the conversion of uh, ip address to a 32 bit representation you will get that and when you see this IP address, it has four individual numbers, isn't it? So let's divide them. So we have 192.168.123.54 and we'll divide this into four parts. So 192.168.123.54. So this belongs to which class? I hope you remember the class actually we saw that previously in the list of charts that we had. So it is a private IP and it's a class C of private IP whose range is from 192.168.0.0 to 192.168.255.255. Have you seen this anywhere? I think you have like something in your home. Okay. So, so this is the type of private IP that we are currently using for the example. Okay. So now if I convert this into binary, I have the values like this that I've already spoken about. 
and the first three numbers form the network address which lets you distinguish between the host and the network itself and the last part is actually your host so 192.168.123 is the network address remember this very carefully and the 54 points to the host itself it can be your own computer that you're currently using right now so it forms each of 8 bits network for the three parts and 8 bit host for the last part so as you can see here we have 8 bits network so basically it forms the network address and we have the 8 bits host and further actually the last 8 bit host also is divided into two parts imagine okay so one of which is the 5 bit subnet and the other one is 3 bit host so imagine you have a network of 128 addresses so out of which one will be the subnet address and one will be the broadcast so out of 128 addresses that you have we will be left with 126 addresses so let's suppose we divide this into four then we will have 32 addresses each so as well now you can reduce two from each of them or two from each 32 so you will be left with 30 that you can multiply it by 4 so that is 120 now if you had original space of 128 network addresses now you will be left with 120 addresses that's how the subnet masking works but i'm sure it's a bit confusing i can assure you that it's completely fine let us discuss or let us see how we can calculate the subnet with the ip pattern so here let us take an example of the ip 192.168.123.23 54 with subnet mask 255.255.255.248 now see this may not be important for the exam but it is a very interesting topic so if you want to skip this i won't stop you but what's the harm in learning something isn't it so please stick around so we have the ip address 192.168.123.54 that is a decimal representation for us and when we convert that into IP binary, we get this binary form or the 32-bit address binary form here. So 192's 8-bit representation is this, 168 is this, 123 is this, and 54 is this. And the subnet that we have taken is 255.255.255.248. So its binary is this, 1111881881s and 51s and 30s. So now what we need to do is a binary AND operation on these two, on these two in the sense these two. IP binary and subnet binary. So I hope all of you are aware of what is binary AND operation. Uh, it's like multiplication. Okay, so with one multiplied by one, you get one and others will be zero because we have zeros and one only in binary, isn't it? So when you multiply zero with zero, it's zero. Zero with one is zero and only one multiplied by one is one. Okay, so we have to multiply or we have to do a binary AND on IP binary and the subnet binary. So if you start from here, so zero, 0 0 0 1 1 0 0 so it will be 0 0 0 so four zeros and uh, these two are also zero because this has a zero and one one so sim similarly if you try to multiply all these things you will get this type of representation okay so we have multiplied this now both of them uh, by using the binary and and we have performed this operation and now the value that we get here is 192.168.123.48 okay so this is the subnet address okay for us this is the subnet address now and the subnet binary that we have is this one that we have already uh, captured before so now we will divide this into the network address part and the host part and that host part also as we discussed previously can be divided into two parts that is for the subnet part the five bit subnet and the three bit host so three bit host that you see here starts from zero 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 okay so this is zero 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 remember this very carefully and the ip binary that you have here also this one this ip binary i'm saying not this one okay so this is the subnet binary i'm saying subnet address binary i'm saying okay not the one that we had already taken before okay so this one actually starts from 00110000 okay so this is the one that we have generated using the binary and okay so this will be the first ip address okay so this is the 48 becomes the first ip address for us similarly we will calculate the next ip addresses and that is the most important and interesting part okay so you imagine i hope you remember binary addition so we will do this right now let's go to the next slide so now you can read along with me that our first ip will be 48 and that is with 5 bits of subnet and 3 bits of host 
so you see 3 bit 0 0 0 is 48 and the next ip will be determined by adding plus 1 to the 3 bit host only to the 3 bit host not to the subnet remember that okay and we are going to add 1 to only to the 3 bit host so it will be now 0 0 1 for the first one okay if you combine 0 0 1 1 0 plus 0 0 1 it becomes 49 so this is our second ip so we have calculated the first ip that turns out to be 48 when we combine both of them and once we combine both of them on the second one by adding plus one we get 49 okay similarly similarly we have all the address ranges here so similarly when we add plus one again it becomes 0 1 0 and that is 50 so upon adding one more then it becomes 1 0 0 that is basically 52 then it becomes 53 and then it becomes 54 stop right there and the last one that we have is yes 55 and that is the last one and i'll tell you why and why that is last because adding one more will change the subnet itself it will change from 00 0110 to 00 0111 that is where we should stop it and we'll not move forward because it is not acceptable and as i've already mentioned before it has one network address that was 48 that was the first one that we have and it also has one last one that is the broadcast address or the broadcast ip so that becomes 55 okay so 55 is our broadcast ip and 48 is our network ip and out of all these ips that we have we have 49 50 51 52 53 54 and these are the ips or the six ips that are usable hosts and now you can also try this by doing calculations from your side and trying to find out if i use a particular ip address and a particular subnet mask or the subnet group that we have then how many ips i can determine from there itself so now let's check the slash 16 based subnet and let's see how that works so now let's suppose we have the cider for 192.168.0.0 slash 16 and you must remember that the cider value ranges from 0 to 32 and it's not different from the ip pattern subnet actually that we saw just now so if you see here you will realize that the subnet 255.255.0.0 slash 16 is called slash 16 so when you say slash 16 or 16 it means that it has 16 ones in the subnet binary pattern okay so when you convert this into 32 bit representation you will see it has 16 ones and the rest are all zeros and it means that the values that are with the zeros these zeros these two parts are the ones that are going to change when you create subnets out of it or when you create the ip patterns out of it so that is why here in the diagram if you see 255.255.0.0 if we convert that into 32 bit representation we have 11 or 11 like this is 8 ones and 8 ones and uh, all the rest of them are 0 and if we use the ip range of 192.168.0.0 the last ip that we will get is 192.168.255.255 and that is where we say that only the last two bits are going to change because there is nothing to be available here because it is already packed okay so you cannot accommodate more than this because there is no range itself and with this ip range you can see there are a lot of hosts that we can calculate that is around 65,536 ips so that's a huge amount of hosts but how did we get this value then so there is a very simple formula for this so slash 16 is 2 to the power of 32 minus the subnet value that is here 16 so it's 2 to the power of 16 so basically 32 minus 16 is uh, 16 so 2 to the power 16 is 65536 hosts and similarly so here we have slash 18 that is 2 to the power of 32 minus 18 that is 14 so 2 to the power of 14 which allows 16384 ips and similarly we have slash 24 which allows 256 ips and we have 32 that is 0 so 2 to the power of 0 is allows actually 1 ip and we have 2 to the power of 32 minus 0 so it allows all the ips okay so when you see when you see this 16 or 18 or 20 try to imagine by converting that into the 32 bit address uh, representation so bit representation that you have and imagine that they have 24 ones and the rest of them are zero so how you can imagine this is basically so if you divide 32 into four parts you will have eight binary representation bits isn't it so you have to imagine like if i take 16 
then 16 ones will represent two spaces of the IP block and the next two will be usable or it will be used or it will change. So when I talk about slash 16 here, I tell that last two numbers can be changed or will change. And when I talk about slash 24, so 24 actually covers three parts of the third to bit representation. Okay. So then the last last number will change or the last part will change. So if you see it allows only one IP, then no number changes. You have to use the same IP address. And if you see here, it allows all the IPs and all IPs, all the all numbers can change. Okay. So there are no ones here and all the places that you see are zeros in all the four parts of the 32 bit address representation. Okay. So that is how we actually try to remember these things. And this is just one form of hard work to get this data actually, but to help us, there are plenty of sites that can actually help us get this data as well. So for you to practice today, so today's task is to calculate the total IP range of 192.168.123.54 with subnet of 255.250.250.240 and comment down below with the calculation details and don't copy paste from others. Okay. So you have to calculate this IP range of how many IPs that we are going to get, what is the network address, what is the broadcast IP, everything. Okay. So you can comment down below with the, your findings and your calculations and I'll heart every right answer. Okay. And that's all for the today's session. I hope you enjoyed this and make sure you check out the first part of VPC if you haven't. The link is in the description below. And if you wish to support me, then the links of Instamojo, PayPal and Patreon are right in the description as well. So until next time, it's Pythalic signing off.